Good morning, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, it says, correct? Let's stand and let's dedicate our hearts to the Lord. How many know that Jesus is already here by his spirit? We never have to call down heaven. Can you imagine how difficult that is to call down heaven? Better yet, step into the spirit and get your heart ready. Um, this might be an intense sermon today, so I want you to hang in there and uh, let's see what happens. Amen. How many have ever struggled with unforgiveness? Just three of you. Okay. That might be a little wrong. I'm going to tell you that today how to master any unforgiveness that will come down your, your life. Any. I know some of you are thinking, well, now is a good time to sneak out. <laughs> it isn't. It's going to be good. I'm going to show you how to do that out of the word. Amen. Because the, the prayer pattern is this. Forgive us our sins. What comes next? As we forgive those who have sinned against us. It's a two-way street. And so I want you to grab a hold of it today because the principles that we're going to learn today are going to be life-giving to you. They're going to be life. Amen? Jesus. Father, we give you praise this morning. We dedicate our hearts to you, Father. And I thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace and your goodness to us every single day. Just as Israel experienced the manna every morning, it was fresh. So we experience a fresh, new presence of God every morning. And today, Father, is a special day in that we're all gathered together <clears throat> to worship you. And so direct our hearts. Guide us this morning. Lord, I pray for a spirit of revelation, deliverance, restoration. In the name of Jesus. Father, we lift up our nation to you. We lift up our president and vice president to you, Father. Lord, no matter where they are on the on the scale, Lord, you can speak to every heart. In fact, your word says that you turn the heart of the king. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would take our nation, Lord, and restore it, Father. Restore values, morality, Lord. We ask your forgiveness for, for uh, the laws concerning abortion and all of those things, Father. But Jesus, cleanse us as a nation. Lord, don't let us live uh, in a nation that's covered with blood, Father, but rise us above it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And so, Father, this morning, we look to you. Our eyes are fixed on you, Father. In Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Amen. Praise the Lord.
for your spirit that is here with us this morning, Lord. As Pastor said this morning, that we step into your presence this morning. We intentionally come into your presence this morning, Lord, expecting 
just hearts full of expectancy to receive from you this day, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for who you are. Our Savior, our Redeemer, the lover of our souls. We're so grateful, Lord, that you've never left us. We thank you for your word that says you will never leave us nor forsake us. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. We're so thankful, Lord, for who you are, that despite of anything that we're going through, despite of anything that's going on in the world, Lord, we can stand and say that you are God alone. And that we put our trust in you, Lord, and that we we just surrender all of our worship to you. And thank you, Lord, for being our king. So we enter into your presence this morning, Lord, hearts full of thanksgiving for who you are. We're so thankful, Lord, that we can stand and say that I will praise you, Lord, no matter how I feel, no matter what's going on. We stand and say that I will praise you. Can you do that this morning? Stand and say, I will praise you. In the midst of anything that's going on in your life, you can stand right now and say, I will praise you. Lord God, we give you our worship this morning that it may be a sweet sound to you. Thank you for the opportunity to praise you, Lord. Sing it from your heart. And I vow to pray.
Lord, we pour out our hearts in your presence this morning. And we thank you for being here.
we open our hearts in your presence, Lord? In this moment, Lord, nothing else matters. We put all things aside so that we can focus on you. Let this song be a daily reminder of who Jesus is. He is the center of our lives. Surrender our worship in your presence this morning. his spirit to speak to you this morning. from your heart today.
Lord, as a congregation we sing, from my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center, it's all about you, yes, it's all about you, from my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center, it's all about It's not about us, Lord. It's all about you, Jesus. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the In all that we do, in all that we say.
time church to the king Every time I sense my emotions taking my life up and down, you know, when it's good, I'm happy. When it's bad, I'm sad or mad. <clears throat> I realize that he's not at the center. And I always go back to this illustration. Pardon me if you're tired of it, but it's still good. <laughs> if you have an automobile and one of the tires the, what do you call that thing? It comes, the axle doesn't, doesn't come to the center of the tire. What happens to your car? If, if you go fast, you're going to go nuts. If you go slow, you're going to do this. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Way too many of God's people have an enormous spiritual bank account and they never use it. They're always going up and down, up and down. One time I'll see them and they're all happy and excited. Next time I'll ask them how they're doing and I wish I didn't. I'm sorry, you can see my expressions on my overhead, so I should keep my expressions to myself. Right? But, um, but if I put Jesus in the center, now what, is, what in the world does that mean? It just means that everything I go through, that I come to him. And I acknowledge him. He may not change the situation. Come on. Come on. He may not change the situation. He may change you in the situation, which is actually a better way. Right? I don't know why the devil has all this capacity to undermine God's people, but one thing I do know, if you let him, he will. If you don't let him, he can't. Man, God is good. <clears throat> and I appreciate those watching online. Um, I'm so glad that, I'm not glad for the COVID, but I'm so glad that the COVID situation forced us to go online. And so I appreciate all the high tech guys back there. Amen. Definitely appreciate that. We've got an amazing team in this church. 
Appreciate the worship team behind me. Amen. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. I appreciate the, the people who work with our kids. Man, I'm glad you're doing that. I can't. <laughs> There's no way I can do that. No way. No way. Uh, I don't even know if I want to do it once to bail you out. I just, no, go ask somebody else. I love the kids. I love the kids. Don't get me wrong. I love the kids. I just don't like them all in one place. I'm kidding. You know, I'm kidding. But So I appreciate everybody, the ushers, the whole, everything. There's so many people that make the service work. You know, it's not just one person or two people. So many people. I appreciate the council who checks out, you know, all of our finances and everything. And I appreciate all of our leaders. We're in a good church, guys. This is a good church. In fact... Last Sunday, I handed out a little sheet of paper that showed you some of the things that were, and I stressed some, some of the things that we're involved with in, in missions. I left out several things, including Zuni, and I just had a, a phone call with Arden, our, my friend there, and uh, we're going to, I don't know if I shared this last Sunday, but anyway, we're, we're going to focus on Thelma, his mother. She's 94 years old. So every period, every, every once in a while, I'll focus on one of the older Native Americans, and I just want to bless the socks off of them, amen? So if you want to help financially with that, just go uh, to Tithely or to uh, our Restoring Touch, rtinc.org, and you can donate through there. And, or you can plop it in the, in the offering baskets at the end. In fact, thank you so much for all your giving. Man, <clears throat> we have done so much. And so oops, I, I really hope that the doors will be open at the end of the year to go to China. I really hope. I want to do that very bad. I can't go back to Tibet until further notice from China, if ever again. But there are Tibetans in China that I want to bless. And we have an, we have an actually, we have a, an invitation to go to an area called Yushu in the Xining province. And it's, if you know where Tibet Autonomous Region is, it's just right above. So I'm excited about the things that God has for us. Amen? Amen? Amen. And Felicia will share a few more things that are happening. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this incredible, uh, uh, these incredible songs and just, Lord, the message that they proclaim. That you'll never abandon us. Now, Lord, you are truly at the center of our lives, and I pray that we would walk that way each and every day. So thank you, Father, for your great mercy and provision in Jesus name amen amen Felicia amen are we happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord amen and we are so blessed to gather in person and online so we welcome you to Christian Life Center this morning and we thank you for being here. Um, I will be making a few announcements um, with some upcoming events. Um, the first update is all of our Lighthouse updates. Um, so I do want to remind everyone that the new hours are Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 11 to 2. Um, please call if you need to make arrangements outside of that time. Um, but at this time, those are our new hours. They used to also be in the later afternoon too, but it's just 11 to 2. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And volunteers are still needed and welcome. On Friday, I don't know if you guys see any updates on the Lighthouse page or on Donna's page, but on Friday, they served almost 80 families and had 10 volunteers here. So there's plenty, plenty of places that you can help with, um, with their foundation. So if you're available to come and give a helping hand, um, Donna and the team would greatly appreciate that. Um, but there's plenty of cars that come through here. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have come here during the week. Um, there's late pickups after our hours of uh, different churches and shelters that come um, to pick up food. So we thank God for this um, opportunity to have Lighthouse here. Um, so, again, if you're able to be a helping hand during the week when they are here, or even on their off days when they're stocking and things like that, um, you're more than welcome to stop by. Um, and also on Saturdays, they are doing mobile delivery. 
Um, so if you are available to be a driver and would like to take food to someone who's in need, these are for the elders who are homebound, um, who cannot drive here and bring themselves if they need food. Um, if you're available to do that, um, please touch base with Donna as well. Um, and while I'm there with Lighthouse Announcements, the food distribution is next Saturday. Um, and they will be honoring Father's Day. Amen? Let's give it up to the fathers. And so, again, that is every third Saturday of the month. Every third Saturday from 10 a.m. to 12 a.m. Lighthouse is here all set up in the parking lot. Um, thank you to all of our church members who have volunteered. If you have family members who have come through to volunteer, you don't have to go to church here to volunteer. Everyone is welcome to come and give a helping hand. This is a good time to be at service to the communities. Um, so if you know any church groups, any youth groups um, that are looking for something to do in the summer, please invite them out and have them come every third Saturday of the month to be a helping hand with the food distribution. Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you, Alan Donna and the team for all that you guys do. We love you. We appreciate you. And thank God for his healing over you, Donna. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, everyone, for your prayers. Um, so we continue to keep you and the team in prayer for all the hard work that you guys do. We love and appreciate you. And also, um, life groups are still open and still available, so you can sign up in the foyer after church. There are some groups that have already met. Um, there are some that are going to meet. So if you would like to join, please sign up. Um, this is a great time to fellowship outside of church. So life group is just small groups getting together outside of church. Some do um, games, some do just food, some take naps. <laughs> That's good too. Um, but everyone's group is a little different how um, the host wants to design it. Um, but the goal is for everyone to get together outside of church just for a small time of fellowship in small groups at a time. Um, so if you are a life group leader, uh, we like for, the, for everyone to meet at least twice a year. We shoot for like early part of the year and then we have home for the holidays. Um, if you want to meet in between that, that's fine too. Um, but that's the basics of life group. So if you haven't signed up yet, please do so in the foyer after church. Um, one other reminder is this Saturday, June 12th at 9.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall, we will have the monthly men's meeting. Um, so that's one, uh, every second Saturday of the month in the Fellowship Hall. So if you need any more information, please see Don Alanis. Um, they do meet on Mondays as well, every other Monday. And tomorrow will be the Monday that they meet. So every other Monday is available as well. Um, the last announcement that we're excited to make is we're going to have a family movie night here. Um, this will be on Friday, June 25th at 7 p.m. in our fellowship hall. So doors will be open at 6.30 and the movie will start at 7. Don't ask me which movie because I haven't picked yet. <laughs> so if you have any suggestions, you're more than welcome to let me know. But this will be a great time of fellowship, especially for the kids, um, but especially as families. Um, so this is a free event. There's no cost. So you can invite your neighbors, your friends. Um, anyone is welcome to come. Um, you can bring your blankets, your lawn chairs, whatever makes you comfortable. Um, but again, it's a free event, and we would like to see you all there. If you do want to come to the movie night, Please sign up with Mary after church. She will be in the foyer. We just need to know um, your head count so we can get an idea of how many people will be there. And um, we'll also be providing snacks as well. Okay, if you have any questions, let me know. Other than that, have a blessed week. Amen. Thank you, Felicia. <clears throat> Felicia. I have uh, 15 or so of these little things uh, about chastity. Uh, she's now dancing with joy in heaven, so if you'd like one. Um. Um, that was Camille, in case. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> Camille, actually, I was going to give you one. I was, I was going to give you the last one, though. Yes, Amen. We're going to pray for Mark and Gina for real this time, <laughs> after service. Uh, they'll be moving to where? West Virginia, y'all. Oh, the kids. Kids, we'll see you. Have a great time in Sunday school. There they go. 
Wow. Hope we have some left here. That's a, that's a big group today. They're also coming from upstairs, in case you're hearing all the thunder. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We are in the fourth part of our series on the, uh, the Lord's prayer pattern for the disciples. Pardon me? No, it's the fourth. Five sides. Next week is the fifth. So the five sides of uh, uh, walking in victory through the prayer pattern, number one, praise, right? First, praise our Father which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, is praise. The second part is declaring his will and his kingdom to come. So, uh, so lining your life up with the will of God. Number one, it's him. Number two, it's his kingdom. Number three, it's provision. We, add, we can ask God for provision. Number four is forgiveness. Number five is something that I've entitled victory from within. Because it's a very, to some people, it's a very disturbing part of the prayer. And so they pretty much ignore the first part. It says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So we, we always, we, we, we can't seem to, to reconcile that in our brain. How can God lead us? He says right here that he would never lead us. And now he says, no, God doesn't tempt us. There's no way for God to tempt us. God cannot tempt us. But if there's an area in our life that we refuse to get a handle on and refuse to be delivered from, he will lead us, he will allow us to be led into that sin to show that that thing is still in us. Many years ago, I was addicted to all kinds of drugs and if you give me the best of those drugs today, I'll just blow it in your face. There is absolutely no connection to anything that I was um, held by in the past. No connection. No connection. And so you can tempt me with that. The Satan can tempt me with that, but there's no temptation. So God doesn't have to lead me into temptation. But there are other things. Now they're a little bit more intense because now my sins are not necessarily visible to you. It's attitudes of the heart. And if I won't deal with the attitudes of my heart, God will allow me to be tested by the enemy in that area. For those of you that want to be pastors or public ministers, I want to say something to you that, that may cause you to think otherwise. If you don't deal, this is what God said to me, Jack, if you don't deal with your sin, I will deal with it openly. Isn't that a fun statement? It's a great incentive for me never to harbor any sin in my heart. Now, you're not off the hook just because you're not a a pastor or a public minister, <clears throat> you know, when you harbor stuff in your heart and you don't deal with it, the enemy's got a hold on you. So are we okay so far? It's going to get really intense and then it'll get really good. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. I praise you, Father, for the power and the victory that you've given to us. Lord, there's no weapon formed against us that can prosper. There's no no strategy of the enemy that can, that can cause us, Lord, to be defeated forever. But Lord, give, give us, the church, your people, wisdom and understanding. Cause, us, cause our discernment, Father, to be able to be keenly aware of the things that Satan may throw in our path. But Lord, outside of all of that, we thank you for the victory that you've given to us. 
In Jesus' name. So let's read Matthew 6 for a moment. Um, just the first part, or I mean just the, the prayer part, um, which starts in verse 5. It says, when you pray, actually the prayer doesn't start there, but this is a good place. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they long to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Now we pray outside, it's called prayer, outside the walls, and we're going to do that every first Thursday of the, of the month, and prayer outside the walls. We're going to kind of focus on uh, 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 City Hall for a while, as we have been. It's a great place to pray. But uh, there might be other places, so uh, I'll make sure that you understand. But prayer outside the walls, we do not do that to be seen by men. Period. Somebody said, well, why are you doing it then? To step right into the air where Satan seems to be glorified, amen? And declare the praises of God in a wicked and perverse nation outside just for the purpose of praying together for the city, for our, 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 our state, for our nation, and above all, for the church. But when you pray, verse 6, go into your room and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So in this manner, the word manner is in, in this way, this pattern, using this pattern for prayer. I can tell you why the enemy has, has caused people to be either asleep concerning this prayer, or not even, they have no revelation of the power of this prayer pattern, because uh, the enemy has made this a, a, a mandatory prayer in many churches. Mainline churches, Catholic, Episcopal, Presbyterian, all those, they, they always do our Father. They, in fact, they even call it that. They've, they've labeled this, they have, they've labeled this the Lord's Prayer. And I don't know why, I'm always asked by the Lord to, to say the real stuff, <laughs> like Adam ruins it all. That's a program. But it's not a prayer, and in, 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 it is in its essence, but it's not a prayer by itself. It's a prayer pattern. Like, you don't, if, if you make dresses, you don't wear the pattern. You use the pattern to cut out the material, to sew it together, to wear the material. So this prayer pattern are, are five open doors, five sides, like the Pentagon is five sides, and, and, and the Pentagon is the center for, for our uh, military defense, etc. So this prayer, this five-sided prayer, is a center for our spiritual defense, this prayer pattern has every aspect of life embedded into it. There is not one need, one concern, one request that is not amplified in this or looked at in this pattern. It has everything. In fact, uh, next week, um, I'll be ending this series, which incidentally, uh, each one of these things is a series. It's huge. Last Sunday on provision, uh, you know, that, there's enough material there. In fact, this particular sermon here, this one, this piece of paper, this half sheet of paper, came from 25 pages of my notes. And that's not even all. That's just 25 pages. Do you know how difficult it is to squeeze an elephant into a keyhole? There's a lot here, folks. There's a lot here. So two years later, uh, the disciples see Jesus praying, and in Luke chapter 11, they say, Lord, teach us to pray. And, and I'm sure he goes, man, how, how, I, how long do I need to be with you guys? You know? He said that actually several times to his disciples. Uh, are you so dull? He even calls them dull. And that's a nice way of saying dumb, but anyway. So he said, well, it's, remember two years ago? He didn't. 
that's not written down, but I know this is what he said, because he told me. He said, remember two years ago when I taught you how to pray that pr pattern? Mm -hmm. Hello? So if they see Jesus praying, and then they ask him, teach us to pray, and he brings them to this pattern, do you think for a minute that he's not using that pattern himself? And any pattern that Jesus uses, anything that Jesus uses, I want to use. Why? Because there's power in that. There's power in that. Man. Are you okay? You good so far? <clears throat> he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So it begins with praise. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So it begins with our priorities on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. It, it, it talks about provision. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It talks about pardon. And, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's power. Now, this last part is not in the original, but it's a good thing. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So next week, when I finish this, I'm going to hand you a, a bookmark, a nice bookmark on this, but it has a few thoughts on how to pray each one of those. All right? Something you can put in your Bible, uh, you can fold and put in your purse, in your wallet, whatever. It's very important. So, today, forgiven and the power of forgiving. Not the power of forgiveness. Forgiven. You are forgiven. Period. You are forgiven. But there's power in forgiving those who offend you. I'm going to say some things, and you're going to experience some things today that might hurt or dig up bad memories. But that's because the Holy Spirit is doing that. Because if this part of the prayer says, forgive us our debts as... We forgive our debt horse. That as refers to the fact that if I don't forgive my debt horse, he will not, cannot forgive me. That's not fair. Yes, it is. Because even in, in, in your own family, if uh, your child uh, really can't stand one of the siblings and he does something wrong and then he he, you know, he asks you, Mom, forgive me, please. But he hates his sibling. You got to deal with that first. Because you can't forgive that kid and allow him to hate his sibling. I've had people uh, in my life that were close to me all of a sudden become mortal enemies, and it hurts my heart. Members in your family, all of a sudden they, they tear into each other and there's a rift. That hurts your heart. Because it's not normal for us. God can't stand that. It hurts God's heart. When his kids are fighting each other, it hurts God's heart. He's not tolerating it. It hurts him. Just as it hurts you when there's division in your immediate loving family, it hurts you. I've had parents come to me and say, my, my kid will have nothing to do with me, and they break down and cry. Because it hurts. It's a very real thing. And today, in the body of Christ, prophecy, today in the body of Christ, too many people think they have the victory, and yet Underneath is a, is a cauldron of unforgiveness. Bubbling. Which ultimately and one day in a moment of weakness will erupt and destroy many lives. Way too many of God's people also have no understanding and no clue and don't have the wisdom to know that when they are offended and they bring that offense to someone else that is not related to the offense, they fulfill the word in Hebrews where it says that it will spring up 
an offense will spring up and defile many. And many people have been defiled. It, in fact, let me even take it outside the church for a moment. And let me tell you why the church thinks it's okay to, to not forgive. Because our nation has been baptized and saturated in a spirit of unforgiveness and hatred that is paramount. It's all across our nation. It's every race, every class, every political issue. Everything is riddled and saturated with unforgiveness. And now the church has the calling. Listen, this whole sermon is a prophecy. I don't need to prophesy to give a prophecy. And I'm not labeled as a prophet. But I do have the words sometimes. And I feel like, Lord, why do you give me these words when I am nobody, when I'm just nobody, when I'm just pastoring a small church and I'm just, I live on, on Gibson Street and I drive a, a black little car that's constantly pooped on by birds and bees? Have you ever noticed those little yellow specks on your car? I heard that was bee poop. I have never heard of that. I thought, what's, why is my car spotted with yellow? I mean, I, I tried, I, I was getting mad at, I was getting offended at my neighbor, too. I said, he needs to cut that tree down. So I park over here behind Jane, and all of a sudden it stops. So I park back to where I was, and I look straight up, and there's nothing there. I said, my. So I know I have to forgive, I have to, Ask two to forgive me. I was, I'm not mad at him. It's not his. It's bee poop, I found out. Who told me that? Somebody in the church. Robert, are you here? Robert told me. He, Robert said, I asked Robert. And he goes, well, I have no clue. So he looked it up. He Googled bee poop. <laughs> now, bee poop, if we eat their saliva, so their poop isn't bad either, probably. But I'm really not going to. Find out. It's got a good taste. If you see me licking my car, rebuke me, please. <laughs> it's huge, this spirit of unforgiveness. It's huge. It's, it's a national spirit. And as the church of the living God, we must rise above that. We cannot, and it begins with me, keeping my heart right about everybody all the time. I cannot allow unforgiveness in my heart. You know, although God has forgiven us all for our own sin, this is number two in your notes, I guess, um, many people still feel justified in their unforgiveness, unaware that forgiveness is a two-way street. Uh, now, I've, I've, let me read to you uh, some of these scriptures. Psalm 103, uh, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed... Our transgressions, our sins from us, as far as the east is from the west. If God said, as far as the north is from the south, so far have I removed my, your sin from, from you, then that's, that means that my sin will come back again. And God will say, hey, remember when you did that? But no, it's from the east to the west. East never goes west. And so God will never remind you of what you did that you've been forgiven of. He always deals with the current, present situation. Gen uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, and you being dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. Wow. He's not only taken your sin away, he has given you the power of God, man, to walk in forgiven life. Colossians 3, uh, 12 and 13. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. 
If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Man, I can't make it any plainer. God doesn't allow me to live in unforgiveness. He doesn't allow me to le live in unforgiveness. Notice that. Because we all have unforgiveness. But the moment we come to him and confess it to him, and in fact, at the end of this, I'll show you uh, four keys on how to do that. But I can't live in unforgiveness. Can you imagine hating someone who is also a believer because they said something mean about you behind your back and then all of a sudden you both die and go to heaven and there you are? Both of you are going to say, How'd you, why are you here? So it's pretty good, actually. I think it's really good to, in your heart, forgive people. Now, let me, tell you, let me tell you something. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is, if you're waiting for a feeling, that's not what happens first. Feelings come. What's the first thing? A decision to release them. Yeah, but they, they haven't forgiven me. Who cares? That's not your issue. Your issue is your heart. And if you clean your heart and forgive that person in your heart, even if you don't feel like it, even if, if thoughts of anger and hatred even come, you know, just boom, reject them. Your decision is, I'm going to forgive that person. You're forgiving that person. It's not a feeling. The feeling comes after the decision over and over and over, but it does come. It does come. Are we here? See, the, uh, people watching online can tune me out, but you can't. You're here. You're stuck. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I do really appreciate people. And, you know, uh, it's pretty neat to see that other people watch our service, you know, throughout the week. You know, so we have a, a larger congregation than I think we realize. So what's, just one thing before I get into the, the gist of this whole thing. If, if you turn to Genesis chapter 4, I mean, there's so much, so many uh, uh, illustrations in God's word <clears throat> uh, about the, the, the consequences of hanging on to an offense or uh, anger or something like that. There's so many, so many stories, and one of the main ones that we see is, in, is the situation with with Absalom and David, and that whole thing. In fact, the uh, little code that I have, or the little QR code that's in your bulletin, if, if you scan that later, uh, it's, it's an entire uh, teaching that I have on, on guarding against the defilement of an evil report, which is, what, which is what happened to Israel. And Absalom divided Israel, almost destroyed Israel, because he had an offense with his father. It's a very intense teaching. And I liken this, this um, regarding this defilement of an evil report as sickness, the stages of, of getting sick. And it's very worthwhile to read, if you, especially if you have a problem uh, in, with uh, forgiving someone, even if that someone has nothing to do with you because you've been defiled. Right? <clears throat> Hello? And so here in uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 8, I'm just going to read uh, um, chapter 2 now, or chapter 4, verse 2. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the offering of his uh, firstborn of his flock and their fat, and of the fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but God did not respect Cain and his offering. Now, let me tell you why God did not respect it. First of all, um, Cain was a tiller of the land. He was a farmer. And for him to bring an offering to the Lord, it meant that he brought an offering from something that was already cursed. Right? Because the land was cursed. Remember that? Genesis 3. And so he brought... Uh, 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 an offering from something that was already cursed. But secondly, secondly, God never operates in secret. 
Cain knew exactly what he was supposed to bring. Because God in Genesis 3 takes two animals and sacrifices them and takes the, 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 the fur, the skin, and makes clothing for Adam and Eve. So Cain was fully aware that what God meant was that there, there is no forgiveness without blood. Even back then. You think for a moment that Cain would be ostracized and cursed because he didn't know something? No, he knew about it, but he, he said, no, never mind, I'm going to bring this. And, and he brought a cursed offering. So verse 4, Abel also brought the firstborn of the flock and their fat, and the Lord respected Abel, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? God never asks a question for his own benefit. Hello? God never asks a question because he doesn't know the answer. He asks a question because he wants you to realize what's happening in your heart. So he says, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is to have you, but you should rule over it. Let me, let me give you another from the Amplified. And if you do not do well, but ignore my instruction, sin crouches at your door, and its desire is to overpower you, but you must Master it. Everybody say master. You must master it. You need to master your, your emotions. You need to master your anger. Because if you let that anger go, you're going to be in prison. You need to master these emotions that, that are detrimental to yourself and to others. You can do it. God wouldn't tell you master it if you can't do it. We have the power to do it. We have the power to walk without an offense in our heart. My family didn't like me. So instead of going, well, I don't like you either, which actually I did say at first, God says, well, that's the way I would do it. So I began to change it. I have no problems with my entire family now. None. My sister-in-law, Ava, went to be with, with the Lord, my older brother's wife, and that, I took that as an opportunity to completely wipe it all clean. I gave to the fund, I, I blessed them, I, and everything is different. I want to I share something, and I don't have much time. Um, I'm not doing this, I'm not sharing this to, um, to exalt myself, nor am I sharing this with you to say to you that what you're going through isn't as bad as what I went through. So I want you to take authority over those thoughts. All right? Just take authority over it. Because that's not what I'm doing. I'm not doing this. I'm not going to share in the next few minutes uh, what happened to me uh, to exalt myself because I did learn to master it. But neither am I saying to you, you know, what, what you're going through is, isn't very much, so suck it up. I'm not doing that. So my daughter's murder is something that most of everybody, you've probably heard me talk about it. But what you didn't um, hear me talk about, you can throw a picture up for a minute. Somebody said, well, what does she look like? There's, that's her right there. She was, she's an incredible person, very intense. In fact, she was quite intense. <laughs> when we moved to Flagstaff, uh, she and I were just verbally jousting, you know, with each other. Oh, yeah, well, the, and she hit me really hard, like, like Wendy hits me sometimes. Bam, on that thing. And, and, and she said, and I'm going to beat you to heaven. We were trying to outdo each other. And she said, I'm going to beat you to heaven. Boy, was that a prophecy. She is in heaven. Two guys murdered her. Long story short, you can see it on, uh, there's an a Animal Planet video about it. If you want to know and want to see it, I, I can give you the link. It's unbelievable. Two guys. One was a transvestite, which is why I hate that spirit. These two murdered her, buried her in a shallow grave in the um, Apache Reservation, Mescalero Apache Reservation. 
they were looking for her for over a month. And the uh, police officer, uh, uh, what's his name? Born, Wolfgang Born. He, he was he had the cadaver dog, and they were and, and they were going to actually literally call it off. And the wind shifted, and the cadaver dog perked up. This is the last moment of the search. Perked up and led him right to, right to her body, decaying body, and the animals had already begun to uh, dismantle it and everything. This is heavy stuff. I'm glad the kids are not here. Um, it was an intense season in my life. I was pastoring in Flagstaff. And right about that same time, they asked me to come here to pastor this church. And I basically said, you have no clue what you're asking me to do. I cannot do this. I cannot do this. And I began to develop a hatred for these guys like you wouldn't believe. Because they, they didn't instantly... Put her, they choked her to death, and she was struggling and probably clawing and all that. She was a, I'd hate to, it took two guys to do that. And they were arrogant. We went to the court for one of them, and uh, arrogant, unbelievable. So after the court, I went back home, and I said, now what? I did the funeral for her. Went back home, and I said, now what? And I began to develop this hatred in my life. I don't even know if Jane understands really the hatred that was there. I mean, I know she does, but it wasn't visible. And I came here. <laughs> and I said, God, why? Why here? Why? My, my, my support system is in Flagstaff. Why did you remove me from my support system? This is what he said, and he said this in many different times, in many different ways. There's a bigger picture here. I said, okay. So I, I, before I came here, <clears throat> I used to go to Twin, Twin Arrows there. It's on I-40 going east. You'll see two arrows. I used to go out there in the desert with a stack of photographs or, or, or copies of the front page of this uh, of the Rio Dosa newspaper with their picture, big old pictures. And I would pray. I would, first, I would curse them. I would curse God. I would stomp. I, I would just freak out, and then I'd ask forgiveness and pray. Come out the next time, whenever that was. I would repeat that. I would, and I, I began to realize that I was mad at God. Here's why I was mad at God. Remember the cadaver dog? Before the wind changed, an unbelieving policeman said, God, if you're real, show us where Liz is buried. Boom. So I had a problem with that because God was not there when she was killed, but told him where she was buried. Come on, give me it. I, I don't need your sympathy because I'm totally fine. I, I'm not trying to scare you because it's part of my story. It's how I mastered something in my life that was beyond me to be able to do that. I mastered it. You can't offend me for very long. Period. And so uh, it just got, it got better, actually, because I don't know how many times I went out there. I, had, I know I photocopied 50 copies, and I probably had to photocopy more. And, it, and all of a sudden, I was released from that. But there were other things, self-pity, all these emotional garbage. Oh, my God. And then having to face a new church, I started getting angry at, at God, at them, at you, because when I first shared this story, when I first shared this story, you just sat there like deer in a headlight. And no one came up to me and said, how are you doing now? I got really offended at this church. Not at you, don't worry about it. Totally fine. But I'm just telling you, I got very offended. And so now I all of a sudden I had this massive offense and anger and every Sunday, I had to come to this church and say, God loves you, and preach. And I'd go home, and ha. Ah. In fact, it got so bad one time that I took Jane's car, put my stuff in her car. We were living in Marina Valley. And when I left on a one-way trip, I was not coming back again because I didn't trust myself with her. I didn't want to hurt her. 
Hello? Am I making this clear? I don't know if I am or not. And so I had to master this horrible force in my life. How did I master it? Well, it's, look at your notes for a minute. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 through 21, I don't have the time to read the whole thing. I hope you're okay, because we're going we're, we're gonna to take a breath here and get better, okay? <laughs> uh, you needed to know, first of all, that what, when I talk about forgiveness, I know what I'm talking about. Because a lot of people, to pastors, when they hear heavy sermons, they say, well, you've never experienced what I, you've always been in this, in this cloud thing, you know, playing your harp, and so you don't know what, the, what we in the real world deal with. I was, I know exactly what you're dealing with. And when God said, there's a bigger picture here, here's one little, one little slice of that statement. I, I was asked to preach the gospel in Hopi jail, in the Hopi jail. I did that a few times, but this one particular time, they, they had found out about Liz, and so they asked a question, and I went ahead and just shared my testimony. And there were 22 Hopi guys there, and 22 of those Hopi guys got saved that night. Right? 22. And in fact, uh, a couple of months later, the mother of one of those 22 guys said, she came to me and she said, Jack, I'm so glad, that she was a believer, I'm so glad that you shared your story because Cookie, that was his name, Cookie was like this tall, big old sugar cookie. She said he, he got in an accident and he was killed, but I know that he knows the Lord because of you. And who knows, because the, I've, had, I've had comments from Europe, from other places around the world for this, uh, this video, you know, how did you do it? How were you able to, how, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's been really an amazing journey. I'm not different. I am not a super person. I have no power. I'm probably weaker than some of you. I just trust in God. I don't have any power. I don't have willpower sometimes. But God. But God. So these four things, can you bear with me just for a few minutes? <clears throat> and so in this example here, uh, in Genesis 15, 21, uh, real, real quick, um, Joseph was asked by his dad to bring food to his brothers. His brothers decided because he had a, Joseph had a coat of many colors, they were jealous, and so they killed him, or they wanted to kill him. They pushed him instead into a, a, a big hole that they had dug, and they sold his brother, their brother, their youngest, or one of the younger brothers, to the Amalekites who were a, a caravan coming through. And then Joseph ended up in Egypt. He ended up being a slave to Potiphar, one of the higher-ups, and he began to take over his household, and so he graduated up. And one day, his uh, Potiphar's wife wanted to seduce him and kept doing that day after day after day, and finally she grabbed him, and he took off, but she held his cloak. She, con she accused him of... Uh, 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 seducing her. He was thrown in jail with no trial. He was in jail for years and years and years. And two guys ended up in jail there with him, a baker and a candlestick maker. What's, what's the other? But anyway, what is it? Oh, yeah. Anyway, so he had a dream about the two of them. And they said, please tell us. He said, well, this is the dream. You're going to live. You're going to die. And so the guy that was going to live was uh, uh, taken out, uh, uh, freed from prison. And so as he left, Joseph said, hey, remember me, okay, tell, tell him I'm here. He was forgotten in prison for years and years and years, forgotten in prison. He has a dream. He shared the dream with Pharaoh. Pharaoh exalted him to the highest position that anyone could have under Pharaoh. A famine broke out where his family was. They came to Egypt for, for sustenance, for, for food, provision. Joseph recognized him, had to excuse himself, and he wailed, came back. He toyed with him a little bit. They came back, came back. When they came back, finally, uh, the last time, he revealed himself to them, and they freaked. They freaked. Now, how many of you would be offended at your family if they did that to you? They were going to kill you, but they, instead they dug a hole, and they sold you into slavery and took your coat ripped it apart, put some blood on it, and told your dad, he's dead. 
the, the sorrow of, of the father. And we're talking about 20 years, 22 years later. And all of a sudden now, he sees his brothers. This is the story. Step one. Joseph said to his brothers, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Understand that vengeance is God's responsibility. If you've been wronged, vengeance, oh, come on, is God's responsibility. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Romans 12 quotes Deuteronomy 30, uh, 32. So you have to understand that it's not in your place, in your responsibility to bring vengeance. Step two. And this is the way I... I but as for you, he says to his... You meant evil against me. So here's, the, here's, the, here's the, the key. Don't shove your feelings down, nor elevate the offense. I don't have this in your, you'll have to write it if you want to take this. Don't shove it down. Don't shove this feeling down. Don't shove the anger down and pretend it's, it doesn't affect you. No, Let, face it, but neither elevate it. Boy, you did that to me. I'm going to kill you. You, you, can't, you can't do either one. You have to face what happened to you square on. Say, you meant it for evil. You don't even have to say that, but in your heart, no, they meant it for evil. Be honest. They meant to discredit me. They meant to, to, to make all these people be angry with me. They meant to destroy me. But, number three, but God meant it for good in order to bring about, as it is this day, to save many people. Joseph, there's a bigger picture here. There's a bigger picture here. You went through all of this so that your family would come to Egypt and you would be able to provide for them. Understand God's powerful and creative ability to bring his purpose out of an evil situation. See the greater picture from God's perspective. Romans 8, 28. Last step. Now, therefore, he says, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph overcame evil with good, one of the most powerful principles in God's word. So never, never leave it open. Never leave it open-ended. Just because you're, you've asked the Lord to forgive you and to cleanse you, now you've got to do something about that. And in Romans 12, it says to overcome evil with good. This is one of the most powerful principles in the Word of God concerning your victory. When you are able to overcome evil with good, and they're not cookies made with dog poop in it, There's something that, <clears throat> so here's what I did in that. I began to use the, um, Animal Planet video for people. I began to share it. I began to share my victory over it. In fact, when I first came here, uh, a big church, big four square church, um, asked me to come and, and talk about this and, and about forgiveness. And one of them yelled out, it's a big church, um, have you really forgot, forgiven them? So I was honest. I said, no, but I have decided to. And the feelings will come. That was an intense service because one lady came. Oh, my gosh. She began to pour out, pour out because of my story, began to pour out. And she said that, that her, her daughter was pleading with her to kill her because of the pain, and she did. And she didn't know how to come back from that. So I, and she's free today. 
God has a bigger picture for what you go through. It's not all about how you feel. It's about what he can use. Many of you have issues with family members, with friends. And all I can say is that you have to let go. You have to let go. Don't wait for them to let go. Don't wait for them to make the first move. Don't wait for them to ask your forgiveness. Forgive. Just forgive. You say, well, it's not that easy. I know, but do it anyway. Just forgive. Just release. Just release. Something's happening on, on the screen. There's a monkey. We call it a, a monkey trap. This monkey reaches in, and there's a banana in there, and he can't get his hand out unless he drops the banana. And he would rather be beaten to death, boiled and eaten, than to let go of this stupid banana. Somebody needs to let go of an offense that has defined you. And this is, this is forgiveness right here. Ready? Ah! Ah! You walk away from it. Yeah, but what about, no, it's not about them. I'm not talking about them. The, God's going to take care of them. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He's gonna, your responsibility is to walk in absolute freedom. Absolute freedom. Now, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen as you decide change your life. I heard something the other day, it was like this. It said, fathers, pretend you have a daughter, and now she's marrying someone like you. Does that make you smile? If not, change. Now, this didn't come from a Christian source. This came from a secular source. So even the world understands the power of decision. You simply need to, but you don't know what they've done to me. I know I don't. But I know what they did to me. They robbed me of my firstborn. So if I can do it, oh, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Because I want you to live in joy. And I don't want you every time you see this person that all of a sudden brings up all of these ah, hatred. You need to be free from that. So I'm going to pray. I'm not going to have anybody raise their hands. I'm not going to have anybody come forward. But if this prayer resonates in your spirit, I want you to say, say to God that it does for a minute. Would you stand with me? I know how difficult it is. I totally understand how difficult it is. But I want to tell you, I, ask my wife, I am free. I have learned how to master this demonic thing called unforgiveness. You know what the biggest aspect of this was with Liz? You know what the biggest aspect of unforgiveness? It was to forgive God. Imagine that for a minute. God. I didn't realize I had such 
hatred for him. And then I had to serve him by preaching to you. Talk about conflict. Going home, going, yeah, see, nobody listened to me anyway. Why do you have me? God said, whew, you are a work in progress, boy. But he did it. Oof. Because, and then another hurdle. I'm sorry, I'm keeping you later, later. But, and then another hurdle. That, this hurdle was I began to beat myself up because I forgave them. Began to feel guilty. I said, God, is this ever going to end? He said, yes, it will. Forgive yourself now. Ah. I stand before you, ladies and gentlemen, delivered, and I've mastered that part of my life. Now, other things I haven't yet, it's still in progress. But this, I will not allow the demon of, of, of unforgiveness to torment me any longer. And I'm not talking about Liz and all the murders there. I'm talking about today. The little things that I get offended by. No. Even if it's justified unforgiveness. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? No. Father, in Jesus' name, there's somebody within the sound of my voice that needs to know that there is life at the end of unforgiveness. And I pray by the Spirit of God that you would touch them, that you would deliver them, that you would set them free from this, this bondage, Father God, of always struggling with this person that did them wrong. Father, it's time that your body begins to walk in freedom in this area. We do not belong to the spirit of this world. We are different. We are yours. We are your people. And so, Father, forgive us, the church at large. Forgive us for harboring unforgiveness and thinking it's okay with you when it's not. And so, God, you don't expect us to come to you with everything, Lord, but highlight something in our lives, just one thing that we can begin with. One thing. One little thing that we can actually say to that spirit of unforgiveness, I release you. And so Lord, we dedicate this to you. We give you praise. I know many are struggling and in certain areas. But Father, I pray that you would comfort them. I know many have lost sons and daughters. God, would you give them strength and free them. We give you thanks, Father. In Jesus' name. If you need prayer, we'll agree with you. Stand here in prayer. We'll agree. You'll have to come forward, though, as the team sings and everything. But thank you so much for, for allowing me to share this pretty difficult story, pretty difficult sermon, but yet it's part of the prayer pattern. Amen? It's a part of the prayer pattern. We love you. God bless you.
Sorrows and trade them for joy. 